Um, just a couple quick announcements. Thank you everyone for joining us for our third and final presentation of the Draper After Dark series here. Um, please silence or turn off your electronic devices and cell phones. Inevitably, there's always one or two that happens to go off. Um, we're grateful for the support from the Nancy, uh, Nancy Carol Draper Charitable Foundation and Sage Creek Ranch for making all these talks possible. Um, the quality and the caliber of speakers that we're able to bring in year after year has only been made possible through this support. Um, and we thank all of you for coming out on your evening and spending that with us tonight. Uh, these lectures are being recorded and will be uploaded to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of the previous talks from this year or from last year, you can find them there over at YouTube. Just search Draper Natural History Museum. You'll see our bear logo. Click on that and that'll give you access to all of our lectures. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Todd Cerevel. Dr. Cerevel is a professor and department head at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wyoming. Before coming to the University of Wyoming in 2003, Dr. Cerevel was the director of the George C. Frizen Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. Born and raised in Northern Virginia, Dr. Cerevel holds a BA in Anthropology and Zoology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and earned his master's and PhD in Anthropology from the University of Arizona. Specializing in Paleo-Indian period, the first people of New World archaeology, he is also an expert in stone tool technology and human colonization of the New World and the Pleistocene extinctions. He is the author of one book and more than 50 published articles. His major research efforts include the excavation of a 12,800-year-old Barger Gulch site, a Folsom campsite in Middle Park, Colorado, and the Doka Ethno-Archaeological Project, a study of nomadic reindeer herders in Mongolia. He has participated in archaeological fieldwork throughout the American West, as well as in Israel and Denmark, and is currently excavating the Lepre, I'm going to butcher this one, Laprail and Bishop Mammoth sites in Converse County, Wyoming. Please give Dr. Cerval a warm welcome. Thank you, and thanks for coming today. Um, those of you standing in the back, there are still some seats. Uh, I see some in the back row and some in the front if you need a place to sit. Um, <clears throat> it's really nice to see a full room. Um, I'm always impressed by how passionate people are in the state of Wyoming about, about the human past in Wyoming. So today I'm going to talk about the human past, but also about mammoths as well, and really where mammoths and humans intersected. I'm going to start my talk by talking about these bones right here. Um, I learned about these bones in June of 2014. I was in Douglas, Wyoming at the Wyoming Pioneer Memorial Museum. And in one case in the back room were these bones. And what you see standing there in the back is the humerus of a Colombian mammoth right here, radio ulna, which is the lower front limb bone, and foreground kind of fuzzy is a mandible or the, the lower jaw. Um, these bones intrigued me, and immediately I wanted to know how they got there, uh, where they came from, where they were found. Uh, and, and really, I'm going to start with these two questions, and they're going to sort of be central questions to organize my talk. And then third, I want to talk about why do I care. There are a lot of bones in museums, right? But these bones really caught my attention. And in fact, I spent four years trying to figure out exactly where these things came from. And I want to tell you why. So I'm an archaeologist, right? I study past people. Why would I be interested in mammoth bones? Well, let's start with the issue of what is a mammoth. Mammoths are extinct animals in the order Proboscidea. This is a group of mammals that includes the elephants, mammoths, mastodons, and gomphotheres. You've heard of mammoths, and you've probably heard of mastodons. I'd be surprised if you've heard of gomphotheres. The gomphotheres is this animal on the right here. All of these were native to North America, although gomphotheres were much more common as you got further south. Very common from the fossil record of Central America and South America. Mammoths tend to occur more commonly in Western North America and mastodons in Eastern North America. In Wyoming, the mammoths we had were a species we call the Columbian mammoth, not the woolly mammoth. Woolly mammoths were further north up along the ice front. And we had these animals here only about 15, 000, or 13,000 years ago. Mammoths were roaming the plains of Wyoming. This mammoth that you see here is one of the largest ones ever found. You can see it on display in Casper at the Tate Museum on the campus of Casper College. 
Mammoths first arrived in the New World about 1.8 million years ago. They came across the Bering Land Bridge, just like humans did much later. And mastodons and gomphotheres have been in the Americas for much longer, about 10 million years. When we look at the distribution of proboscideans today, so proboscideans simply meaning animals with the proboscis, the, the extension of the upper lip and nose that we know is the trunk, Today they live in two discontinuous ranges in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia, although this map is highly, highly generalized. If we were to zoom in on it, you would see that these ranges are really, really fragmentary. So for example, this is, shows the distribution of Asian elephants in Southeast Asia and India, and you can see that their ranges are really, really fragmented. And the same thing is true in Sub-Saharan Africa. What's interesting is that if we were to look at the distribution of these animals in the fossil record, say 1.8 million years ago, this is where they lived. And maybe the better question is where didn't they live? They lived everywhere they could get to without a significant swim. They never made it to Australia or Madagascar or Greenland, but they were pretty much everywhere else. And there were a huge diversity of these animals, uh, multiple species of mammoths in North America, mastodons, gomphotheres, in Africa, multiple extinct species of proboscideans, and the same is true in Europe and Asia. Across the Arctic, woolly mammoths in southern climates of Europe, you had a species called the straight tusk elephant. They were everywhere. The point of telling you this is that there's really nothing unusual about finding fossil elephant bones in Wyoming. You can pretty much find them everywhere. Where can elephants live? Well, they can live many places. We find them today in tropical forests. In, in Southeast Asia, that's where elephants are perfectly happy, in dense tropical forests. The same thing is true in Africa today, where you have African forest elephants living in the Congo Basin. You, have, of course, have African elephants living in the savanna. The image on the top right shows African elephants, savanna elephants in the Namib desert of Namibia, very arid climates. The lower right is a young Asian elephant playing in the snow. They don't naturally live in the snow, but obviously mammoths are perfectly happy in the snow because we find them in the permafrost of Siberia and Alaska all the time. Elephants can live anywhere, really. Um, large body size, to some extent, allows adapt adaptive flexibility. They're generalists in terms of what they eat. In hot climates, the body size keeps them cool. In cold climates, the body size keeps them warm. In dry climates, body size allows them to retain water. They can live really a lot of places. They get into trouble when you have droughts and when there are food shortages, but it's hard to find an environment that can't support elephants, and Wyoming was certainly one that could. And when you look at their global distribution, this should come as no surprise. So in this context, how did these bones get here? Well, there's a simple answer to that question. Sometime within the last two million years, a mammoth died somewhere near Douglas, Wyoming, I presume, because that's where the bones ended up in the museum. Somebody found them and donated them. Where were they found? Well, the first clues to answer this question came from the display case. This sign says that the mammoth was excavated from Bed Tick Creek south of Douglas. It was discovered by a Dr. Bird of the American Museum, and it was a gift of W.R. Eastman. Where's Bed Tick Creek? Well, it's a tributary of the North Platte River. It's about six kilometers south of Douglas, and it flows for about 14 kilometers, or let's say eight miles from west to east towards the North Platte. It's a fairly big area and not a very specific clue. Because of this, though, we went out to the Bed Tick area and walked that drainage and looked for mammoth bones sticking out of banks with no luck. The next clues came from a letter, and this letter was given to us by the curator of the Pioneer Museum in Douglas. It was written by this guy, L.C. Bishop Lauren. This is Lauren and his wife, Sadie. He was born in 1885. He was a Converse County surveyor and later the state engineer. And this is the letter that was given to us in 2015. The letter was written on June 21st, 1958 to the state geologist at the time, a guy named Horace Thomas. And the letter describes the circumstances of the discovery of these bones. And I'm not going to read you the whole letter, but I'm going to give you a few excerpts. L.C. Bishop says, some 20 years ago, a friend and I dug out the head bones and huge teeth and two front leg bones from the base of a bank on land then owned by me. 
So this is 1958 he's writing this. So he's talking about approximately 1938 when he finds the bones. And the bones he describes are those in that case. He says, the bones are found nine feet below the surface in a soil that's rather heavy and well compacted. He gives a description here of the geology. He says it's where the Dakota sandstone, a geologic formation, is joined. And he gives a very specific location in the northwest quarter of Section 1, Township 31 North of 70, Range 71 West, by the White River Formation or just plain gumbo soil. This guy was a, a surveyor, right? He knows where he is. This is really useful information. Now, a quarter section, that's a half a mile by half mile. It's still not it was right there, but it's like getting us closer, right? He says, after about a J July 8th, I'll be free to go to Douglas and assist in the supervision. And if you're Mr. McGrew, will be available to get us going about that time. What he's doing is he's writing to the state geologist. He's saying, hey, there's this mammoth out there. We want to excavate the rest of it. We could use some professional assistance. Mr. McGrew was Paul McGrew, who was a paleontologist at the University of Wyoming. Well, this is cool, right? This is a lot of good information, except that the Pioneer Museum says Dr. Bird found it. Bishop says he found it. The quarter section identified by Bishop is six kilometers away from Bed Tick Creek. It does not contain the geology that he describes, and he never owned it. <laughs> so he says he found it over here. Here's Bed Tick Creek. Thoughts of contradictions, right? Last year in July, we spent a week in the field in this area looking for it. Now, why would I spend all this time looking for the location where these bones came from? There are a lot of mammoth bones in the world. Well, let me tell you why. I'm an archaeologist. I'm interested in people. I mean, mammoths are cool. These are 20,000-pound animals that roamed the plains of Wyoming in big matriarchal herds. The, ideas of hu the idea of humans interacting with these animals is pretty cool, right? And that's what interests me as an archaeologist. I'm interested in ecological, economic, and social aspects of the interactions between mammoths and humans. And mammoths are one of these animals that we actually have drawings of. We actually have physical depictions of from past humans, like this drawing from Grote de... Oh, sorry, I can't do French. Roof and neck. I'm terrible at French. I speak Mongolian okay, but not French. <laughs> I saw this drawing last summer. It's pretty cool to see the painted caves in France. So here's a painting of a woolly mammoth painted sometime between 40,000 and 20,000 years ago, deep in a cave in France. We've been interacting with these animals for a long, long time. A very long history of interaction with these species. And not just in North America, and not just in France, globally. This record goes way back. This is one of the earliest sites showing human interaction with proboscideans. And I shouldn't say human because humans didn't exist 1.7 million years ago. This is a hominin ancestor of ours. It's not clear which hominin produced this site. Almost certainly it was this one, Homo ergaster, used to be known as Homo erectus, a hominin that was in, not, not close to modern. It was modern in stature. It was bipedal, had a, large, a big increase in brain size from the hominins before it big technological changes as well. And right around this, the time this hominid shows up in the fossil record, we start seeing interactions with these animals. This is a species called Elephas reci from Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania, surrounded by chipstone tools. Whether it was killed or scavenged remains a question that we argue about. But very early on in the archaeological record, we see humans interacting with proboscideans. So this is Tanzania in East Africa 1.7 million years ago. This is a site from Germany called Groburn. This is the remains of a straight tusk elephus, uh, elephant, Elephus antiquus, tightly associated with artifacts. At the time, 120,000 years ago, it was the last interglacial, relatively warm period in Europe. Europe was inhabited by Neanderthals, Homo sapiens and Neanderthalensis, the same species as us, different subspecies, almost fully modern humans. But again, we see this interaction with Neanderthals and proboscideans. Moving forward in time into what we call the Upper Paleolithic. I showed you the drawing, the cave painting from France. 
This is a mammoth rib from a site in Krakow, Poland, 25,000 years ago. And embedded within that rib, you can see the stone tool, probably a spear point right there. Again, interaction between mammoths and humans, in this case, Homo sapiens sapiens, people like you and me, people anatomically like us, people behaviorally like us. If you met these people, you'd recognize them as, oh, that's a person. 25,000 years ago. And of course, this trend of proboscidean exploitation continues to the New World in what we call the Paleo-Indian period, or the earliest period of New World archaeology. This shows a, a mammoth rib cage from a site called the Laner site in southeastern Arizona about 13,000 years ago. Rib here, rib here, and a spear point embedded between them. Interestingly, this shows, I showed you this before, it shows proboscideans 1.8 million years ago versus today. Now let's look at the genus Homo, our genus, we're Homo sapiens. 1.8 million years ago, the genus Homo was limited to the southerly latitudes of Africa and Eurasia. This is a very generalized distribution, but what's interesting is it's very similar to the distribution of proboscideans today. The distribution of Homo today, of course, is everywhere. We've basically swapped places. If we look at this issue globally, humans interacting with these taxa, and we look at it through space and time, so this shows sort of the time-space series here. Red are the oldest sites, green are the next oldest, blue are the next oldest, and yellow are the youngest. You see there's sort of a wave looking at this over a million years, this wave through space and time of exploitation of these animals that comes out of Africa into Europe, through Asia, and into the Americas. And what's really interesting, I think, and some people would say that the pattern is not as strong as I'm claiming, and I think they have a reasonable argument, but I think it's pretty clear that if we look at this pattern globally, what we see is people colonize new regions. As we expand our range across the, the world, and as they do, they hunt proboscideans, and proboscideans suffer extinction locally. We see this pattern where the hunting of elephants in the archaeological record is very much concentrated on what I would call the human frontier, the edge of human expansion. So when we see it in Wyoming or in Arizona, we see it very briefly and in one specific time, and it's right when people first arrive. But that statement can be generalized virtually anywhere in the world, with the exception of where elephants persist today. So of course, in the New World, for a long time, we've known this pattern. We've known that the arrival of, first arrival of humans in the New World correlates with the last of the Pleistocene megafauna. Human arrival, humans show up, and very quickly, animals go extinct. And mammoths are just one of those animals. So this is a classic photograph from C. Van Saints Jr., an archaeologist, geoarchaeologist in Arizona. His daughter's here today, actually. Your dad took this photo and said it to me. He was very proud of it. This is a mammoth tooth here. This is an iconic stratigraphic unit in, in Paleo-Indian archaeology. It's called the black mat. It dates to the end of the last ice age. The ice age ends at the top of this, this upper contact of the black. If we look at mammoths in the fossil record, they end right here. You'll never find a mammoth above that. At least nobody has yet. And that contact dates to about 12,700 years ago. Okay? So before that, we have Pleistocene megafauna meaning ice age, big animals, mammoths, mastodons, gomphotheres, ground sloths, horses. No evidence of humans. Again, that's debatable, but that's my story. After that, lots of artifacts, an abundant archaeological record, no Pleistocene megafauna. And right here, we find both. For this very brief, really interesting time, we find both together in the same deposits. So let's talk about the human story. The humans followed mammoths. They did it 1.8 million years later. And they crossed into the New World across the land bridge. During the last ice age, when all this ice was tied up in continental glaciers a mile thick that covered much of North America, all of the water to build those ice sheets came out of the ocean. And the sea level dropped, which generated this big, broad bridge of land that connected Northeast Asia to Northwest Alaska and Yukon. By around 14 and a half thousand years ago, we know from the archaeological record of Alaska, or what we call Eastern Beringia, humans are there because we find their evidence in the archaeological record. Interestingly, at the time of their arrival, we're pretty sure they were 
trapped there because big glaciers coming out of the, the Canadian Rockies and the coastal ranges connected with big glaciers coming off of the Hudson Bay area. And the way south was blocked by continental ice. Eventually, as the climate warmed and those glaciers melted and they retreated, humans made it south. And by around 13,200 years ago, people make it into the continental United States and eventually into South America. The first people in the New World, we argue about who they are, but we all agree that people were here by what we call the Clovis period. And the Clovis period is named after Clovis projectile points or spear points, which look like this. These ones are from Mexico, but if you found them in Wyoming, they would look pretty much the same. They're the first widespread evidence of people in the New World, and Clovis points are regularly found in association with proboscideans, mammoths, mastodons, and gomphotheres. Most of these sites here are mammoth kill sites. There are a couple. This one here is a mastodon kill site called the Kemswick site in Missouri. This one here in Sonora, Mexico, is called Fin del Mundo. It's Clovis association with gomphotheres. All, in all of these sites, we find these spear points in association with extinct elephants. In Wyoming, we've long known about a site like this. This is the Colby site. This book by George Risen and Larry Todd is a classic in Paleontian archaeology. In fact, Larry's here today. He's one of the excavators of this site. At this site, they found six or seven Colombian mammoths associated with four Clovis spear points and about 30 or 40 other artifacts. It's a really strange, interesting anatomical alignment of bone here, George Frizen, whose knees you see sticking out here. Famous guy, former state archeologist for Wyoming and former department head at the University of Wyoming. And a um, member of the National Academy of Sciences, he suggested that this was a frozen meat cache. People killed this animal and then cached the meat, killed it in the cold season, cached the meat and came back to to later exploit it. I don't know that they ever did. So mammoths were one of a whole series of animals that go extinct. Around 12,800 to 12,700 years ago, North America suffers a massive extinction event. 33 genera of animals go extinct. The word genera is the plural of genus. Many of these genera have multiple species. So we're talking about 40-some species of megafauna, megafauna meaning big animal or animals bigger than 100 pounds, go extinct. It's a massive event. If you were here 14,000 years ago, the big animals around here would re remind you more of Africa than of Wyoming. And Wyoming is famous for big animals today, right? But back then, we had mammoths. The bison were 25% larger. We had camels, horses. The carnivores were ridiculous. We had saber-toothed cats, American lions, American cheetahs, dire wolves. We had giant ground sloths, giant beavers, beavers the size of black bears. <laughs> Wasn't that long ago. I mean, we're talking 700, six to 700 human generations ago. All of these things lived in Wyoming. 12,700 years ago, boom, they're all gone. Now we argue about to what extent it was a simultaneous extinction event? Did all of these animals go extinct in a very short period of time, or was it a long, staggered event? Um, but it's pretty clear that when people showed up in this state and on this continent, most of these things, if not all of them, were still running around. So why do I care about these bones? Well, it's possible that humans killed this animal. You know, we only have about 15 sites, 15, 16 sites in North America that show interaction of human and extinct proboscideans. If humans killed this animal, it's an archeological site and it's a really rare thing. If this animal died naturally, it's much less interesting to me. I mean, mammoths are still cool, but I'm gonna leave that one to the paleontologists. If it's a paleontological interest, it's less interesting to me. If it's archeological, it's much more interesting. So the distinction is pretty simple. On the left, the Colby Mammoth is an archeological site because we have evidence of human interaction with that animal. On the right, the Marquette Mammoth found in fall of 2018 in Buffalo Bill Reservoir, not far from here. It's almost certainly paleontological. There's no archeology span found with that. 
tried to get radiocarbon dates, but it's not datable at the moment because it doesn't have any organic matter preserved. But I'm guessing that this animal died prior to the arrival of humans on the continent. Which then raises the question of the mammoth in the case, what I call the bishop mammoth. How old is that? So the first way I could tell if it was of any interest to me is to get a radiocarbon date on those bones in that case. And the director of the museum was kind enough to let me do that, so I put on my safety glasses and sampled some bone for a radiocarbon date. Keeping in mind, mammoths have been in this state for two million years, right? I'm only interested in the last ones, the ones who lived between about 13,100 and 12,700 years ago. So we cut out a piece of bone, we send it to the lab, and we wait for a date, and we got the date back. This is the date we got. This mammoth died between 12,700 and 12,850 years ago. This is exactly the right age people were around when this mammoth died, assuming this is a good date. Sometimes radiocarbon dates are an error, but if this is an, an error, it's a really darn good one. This is exactly what we were hoping for. Which made this mammoth worth looking for. Where did this thing come from? It's one of the last mammoths in Wyoming. In May of 2018, we took another visit up to Douglas, and in one of the curation facilities downstairs, we found this bag with these bones in it. More clues. This bag says, dated July 16, 1958, bone fragments taken from the location of the mammoth of the elephant family of which we have the leg, jaw, and two vertebrae, now in the museum. Dug out July 15, 1958 by Bishop Hildebrand and Vetter. I remember Bishop's letter was written a month earlier saying, I want to go out there in July and supervise the excavation of this mammoth. And here's evidence that he did. Now, sadly, there were three bone fragments in that bag, but that bag was in a crate, and beneath the bag in the crate was this, which looks like a heck of a lot of fragmented mammoth bone. But there's no documentation associated with it other than that brown paper bag sitting on top of it. Is this the mammoth that Bishop had just dug up? I was hoping most of the mammoth was still left there. I didn't know. Given all the clues we had, last July, over five days, we went to this draw in Converse County. We were basically looking for a place that Bishop owned in the Bed Tick Creek area with the right geology. We went through land records. We used all the clues, and we found this spot. You can see this nice sandstone here. He mentioned that Dakota sandstone in his letter. Over five days, we worked all along this draw, and what we're trying to do is identify places where we had sediments that were 13,000 years old that could potentially preserve a mammoth. To do that, we did something called augering. I'm going to show you what that looks like. That's an auger on the left. Let's see if I can get this to work. So you're drilling down into the ground, collecting about four inches of dirt at a time and laying it out, and you're looking at the stratigraphy to see what the sediments look like subsurface and to collect samples for dating. And it's a really quick way of getting a look at what's beneath the surface and identifying where you have sediments of different age along a draw like this. After four days in drilling about 19 holes, we thought we had identified the best, the most likely location where that mammoth could have been found, and I made my crew dig this trench, the 90 degree day. They called it Todd's Torture Trench. We decided to go for it. Let's see if we can find a mammoth. And it was hot, and you can see there's no shade and there's no clouds. We found some artifacts there and got pretty excited. Have no idea how old they are yet. Break for lunch, come back, dig some more, collect samples, draw a stratigraphic profile the dog is supervising, and then fill it in, and there was no mutiny. I think I got them beers that evening. No mammoth. But we did find a buried archaeological site. Five artifacts in a buried archaeological site. Are they Clovis? I don't know. But we did collect samples of charcoal and soil organic matter that we can use to get radiocarbon dates. So we submitted our samples for radiocarbon dates, hoping to learn we had found 13,000-year-old sediment. As we waited for those dates, sadly, radiocarbon dating is not instantaneous, and there's no lab at the University of Wyoming. And even if there was, it would still take at least a month. It's a long, involved process. But we just learned that Bishop had been there in 1958, and I was thinking, let's see, that's 60 years ago. Maybe somebody's alive who was there at the time. 60 years ago, if somebody was still alive who was out there when, when Bishop and Hildebrand and Vetter were digging up those bones, it probably would have been a kid. 
Let's reach out to the press to see if anybody has any information. So Wyoming Public Media put together this story. Douglas Budget, the local paper, put out this story. And we waited. What fascinates me about this time period is this question. This is, the, this is the kind of opportunity that few people in the history of our species have ever had. What would you do if you were the first person to step foot in Wyoming? What I mean by that is imagine being in a small group of hunters and gatherers who come into this state. Nobody's ever been here. It's full of big animals. You don't know where you are. How are you going to make a living? Your options are endless, basically. Your options are limited by the ecology of the state and the geography of the state, but you can imagine many ways you could make a living in terms of are you going to hunt more, are you going to gather, are you going to hunt big animals, are you going to hunt small animals, how are you going to be organized socially, are you going to live in big groups or small groups, are you going to be egalitarian, are you going to have chiefs, are you going to have big social networks, are you going to have small ones, are you going to move huge distances or slowly move through the state, how would you behave? We as archaeologists are one of the few kinds of scientists, scientists who have the opportunity to study humans living in these kinds of contexts. So it's a really, really fascinating time period to study in human history. And of course, these kinds of questions, these kinds of events were repeated over and over again all over the world, but it's really great to be a Wyoming archaeologist who works in Wyoming and studies the first people. So what do we know about Clovis? The Clovis people are the first widespread evidence of humans in the New World. We know their populations were really low because Clovis sites are damn hard to find. I've been looking for one for a long, long time. I've been digging one for the last four years and it's been amazing, but they're really, really rare. They made these distinctive spear points that we call fluted points. Look like this, fluted because they have these flakes removed from the base that give them this grooved appearance. And we find points like this across the continent. Clovis people, it appears, focus their subsistence efforts on the hunting of large game. Interestingly, the animals that are rarest on the landscape, and those are the big ones, the mammoths, the bison, the horse, camel, these are the ones that are the most common in Clovis faunal assemblages. And these people were extremely nomadic. We know this because we find stone in Clovis sites that has moved hundreds of kilometers regularly. The Clovis site I've been working on is called the Laprell Mammoth Site. So this is my main focus of my work, the Bishop Mammoth Site is looking for the next thing when I'm done with this one. And this is a really cool site. This is what it looks like. This is Laprell Creek in Converse County. That's a tributary of the Platte. This site occurs about a mile from its confluence with the Platte, and those are our excavations uh, in 2017. The site was found in 1986 by a doctor in Douglas named William Heinrichs and his buddy Mike Ernst. They are out showing Mike's dad some teepee rings on a nearby bluff when they found mammoth bones sticking out of this bank here, right in here, although the mammoth at the time was right in this part of the site where you see the reddish vegetation. This is how a lot of Clovis sites are found. It's a lot how a lot of Paleo-Indian sites are found. People. Locals live and working on the land who find amazing things and then share that information with us. Paleo-Indian archaeologists, people like me who do this for a living, who think we're really smart about finding these sites, have a damn hard time doing it. But it's usually people who are out on the land ranching, hunting, hiking, walking who find these sites. So we're really grateful for the help of the public. In 1986, they found this site. Eventually, the word got to George Frizen. In 1987, George came out and tested the site with a small crew. Excavations then ceased for 27 years because of a dispute with the landowner. This is on private land, and we can't work on private land without the permission of the landowner. We weren't able to go back until 2014. And what we have here is a Clovis mammoth kill and campsite. This is from George's excavation in 1987, and here you see the bones of a mammoth. These are the ribs here, pretty much still in anatomical position. The spine is running this way. The head would have been here to the south and the tail to the north. The limbs probably sticking out towards the bank and were probably eroded before we learned about the site and went down the creek. George found a few small flakes and this flake tool in these bones. He thought he had a mammoth kill site. He was pretty excited to go back and pretty bummed out when he couldn't. 
but was very happy when we were able to go back in 2014, and he's thrilled about the work we're doing there now. George is 94, by the way. Still going strong. Still doing field work. What our recent work has shown is that this site is much larger than expected. This site contains a camp area. It's not just a kill. So here you have the mammoth bone bed where George dug just the midsection of that animal. And you see there's all this other stuff area and areas more distant from that animal. So these circles here are proportionate to how many artifacts we found. So bigger circles, more artifacts. So this site has a kill area, a camp area, and several unexpected features for a mammoth kill site. Focusing on this area that we call Block B here, these are our excavations uh, from 2015, I believe, or 2016. We have a big stain of red ochre. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute, but this stain is six feet long and four feet wide. A hearth feature, a fire pit in there, hundreds of artifacts, several tools, butchered bison bone, bone needles, some of the oldest bone needles from the New World the only bone needles ever found in a Clovis site, a bone bead, all this really interesting domestic stuff associated with a mammoth kill. So ochre, what is ochre? Ochre is a natural mineral called hematite. It has kind of a blood red color. Um, we don't know exactly what it's used for. It's very commonly found uh, in human burials. You paint somebody red before you put them in the ground. In this case, that's not the case. So you can see this pink hue in, in the sediments here. This is pigments that people brought in. If you enhance this digitally, you can really bring it out. This is a huge area. These nails are three feet apart. Where they brought in so much of this stuff, the ground became stained red with it. What were they doing with that? Why was it at a mammoth kill? The simple answer is, I have no idea. In this same area, beautiful chipstone tools. These are what we call flake tools. You make a big flake, and then you modify the edge to give it a certain shape. This material is from the, from the Hartville uplift. Most of it's from sort of the Guernsey Hartville area. This is what we call an end scraper, a hide working tool. It's been burned. This is the tool George found. You can see it's a different material. This we call a spoke shave because of the notch. We don't know exactly what it was used for. Here are the needles. They're all broken. It's a really difficult, hard sediments, difficult site to dig. All these are found in the water screen. Most of the breaks are probably because we broke them, but it's the kind of thing where you have to break them to find them. This is an eye here. It's broken across the eye. The tip, they're sort of flat on the eye end, and they come down to a round, very fine tip. And these things are tiny, OK? That's, that scales 15 millimeters, just to give you a better idea of scale. Tiny, tiny, but these are typical for Paleo-Indian bone needles. Bone bead, this is probably the oldest ornament from the New World. It's from right here in Wyoming. You can see some ochre staining on it. Again, this is a tiny little bead. Really interesting stuff that we did not expect to find at a mammoth kill. In fact, nobody's ever found stuff like this at a mammoth kill. Another thing I want to highlight, we thought there might be stuff to the south because we'd see, we were seeing artifacts trailing away in that direction. I thought the center of attention would be up here in the mammoths. So when I saw high densities of artifacts moving south, I thought, well, let's put in some test units down here. And down in this test unit over here, which is only half of a test unit, it's, three, it's one meter by half a meter because we couldn't fit a full test unit. We found one artifact, which is a pretty fun one. A beautiful Clovis point, absolutely typical Clovis point. You can see the flute here. The very bottom is broken. It's missing. But it's 60 feet from the mammoth. But there's no question about what it is. The way we see this site, we see it as analogous to sites that have been studied for recent foraging peoples, like the Mbuti in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who, who traditionally hunted elephants. And when they do, they move their camp to the elephant. You simply can't cut up an elephant and bring it back to your camp. So what you do is you pick up your camp and move it to the elephant. So after they kill an elephant, they set up a camp, and they'll be there for a week, and everybody will cooperate in the butchery and dry the meat and distribute it and then move on. And we think that's exactly what's happening here at Laprell. So these sites are fascinating, right? I mean, they, they tell us all kinds of things about the first people in the New World, the first people in Wyoming. In Wyoming, we're lucky to have two of them and perhaps three of them. I mentioned Colby and Laprell. There's a third one down in Carbon County called the, the 
UP mammoth. This is a geologist, former geologist at the University of Wyoming named Brainerd Mears with the skull of that animal. It was found in the early 1960s in spring deposits. And there are artifacts in there, but it's not clear if they're truly associated because that site was used by people through time and the deposits are really mixed. So this is why I care. This is why I spent all that time looking for that mammoth. So we got our samples for radiocarbon dating and we submitted them and we finally got the dates back. Did we find where these bones had been found? Here are the dates we received. Hoping for 13,000, the oldest sediments we found were 3,300 years old. This is incredibly discouraging after looking for four years. What I knew now is that we were in the wrong place and I really had no clue where to go next. Now, I'm not gonna end on that depressing note <laughs> because two days later after receiving these radiocarbon dates, I got this email from a guy named Pat Neal. Subject, Mammoth. Greetings, Todd. I read with interest the article in the Douglas budget. Well, that caught my attention. Here's an excerpt from Pat's emails. It brought back memories of a time when I was about 12 years old. Our family was friends with the Hildebrands. My mom was an amateur geologist slash rock hound, and we spent time exploring. As I remember, Lyle Hildebrand invited our family to accompany him and friends on a dig. We spent two long weekends on some property where he had found some remains of a mammoth and from what was found, a partial bone of a three-toed horse. I know that much of the mammoth we were digging up was left covered up because it was too delicate to remove, but the bones we collected we took home and cleaned up on our backyard and gave them to the historical museum at the fairgrounds in Douglas. They may be the ones referred to in the article. Since I don't know the specific location you're looking at, this may not be of interest to you. I do know that the discovery was in the bank of a creek bed. I'm certain I have many pictures of us digging at the location and of our backyard with the bones being cleaned. If you're interested, let me know. And I'll dig into my old photo albums, scan the pictures, and send them to you. <laughs> Why, yes, Pat. <laughs> What's your phone number? I call up Pat. I'm like, Pat, what do you remember? Tell me, where'd you go? I don't know, I was 12. I was in the back of my mom's car. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, this is Pat. <laughs> this is a mammoth. This is also Pat. Pat is an IT professional at a company in Oregon. He's 72 years old. Grew up in Douglas. He happens to check the Douglas budget website now and then. So he goes home start scanning photos, sending them to me. Most of these photos are very much focused on the excavation and they're not real helpful in terms of determining where they are. But in these photos, some 38 of them, there were two that provided some interesting clues. One of them had been printed backwards. It took me a little bit to figure that out, but uh, I believe this is Bishop and this is Hildebrand. I may have that reversed. This, I presumed, was Bed Tick Creek and later determined it was. You see this hill? Back behind it, there's this very distinctive white conical hill sticking up. I got on Google Earth and went bananas looking for that hill in the satellite imagery and trying to figure out exactly where this thing came from, right? And, Eventually went out there and we found it because of those two photos. Um, this is a really foggy day. That white hill's here. It's very gray. These guys are standing about right here. If you look at these like this, the draw and how it bends down the hill, this slope is this slope. This slope is this slope. It's changed very little in 60 years. It's remarkable. Here's what I know now. Those bones were found around 1938 and in July, of August, July and August of 1958, most of the animal was excavated by some Douglas locals over two weekends. Some of the mammoth we think is still in place from the photos, that's what Pat says. Um, and some of the photos show like the tusks still in place, we think they're still there. Pat recalls that no artifacts were found, I believe him, he would know. 
Um, and this animal likely dates to Clovis times. What we don't know is what bones are recovered. I have not had an opportunity to inventory those bones at the Pioneer Museum. Now I'm very confident that those bones in that crate are the ones that came from this excavation. I don't know what bones are still there. I don't know if there was any human interaction with this animal or how much of the deposit remains, but these are fun questions to try to answer, right? This is why in my job you go to work every day, because what I do is really fun. So we found it, and we'll see where this leads. To summarize, herds of mammoths roamed Wyoming for almost two million years, and around 13,000 years ago, humans entered this ecosystem, and for a few centuries, people interacted with these animals, hunting them. And I very much believe that it was human hunting that drove mammoths to extinction, not just here, but driven elephant extinction around the world. This event in Wyoming was but a small part of a global story spanning tens of thousands of years, a story repeated over and over and over again as humans colonized the world, leaving proboscidean populations decimated. And today, elephants only survive in isolated parts of the world where the process continues today. Thank you. <laughs>